right, well, welcome. Um, my name is Kara Bowman with uh, Solheim Enterprises, and I'm joined by Bill Light here on uh, the camera, um, also of Solheim, and we want to thank you for joining us for our first town hall discussion. We figured uh, there were a lot of questions that we were getting regarding how to prepare non-EB nurses, so nurses who are coming from maybe inpatient units or elsewhere, on how to work and function in the emergency department setting. Um, and how we can do some maybe some training and stuff with them to make them a little bit uh, more prepared to uh, handle the frontline uh, care that we're giving to these COVID-19 patients that we're starting to see in our emergency departments. Obviously, across the country, a lot of hospitals are seeing more than, and some not seeing as many, but it's, it's a really good idea to get started on training as early as possible so that these nurses are um, feel comfortable in this area. So, we thought we would get a conversation started with you guys about how to train them, what um, the best methods for, who the people are, um, and just give you good ways maybe um, from us as well as some other people in our community to talk about how do we prepare them so that they're comfortable in our department and uh, they feel prepared to take care of these really sick patients that we're starting to see. Um, so I think this goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway. So. Um, as I'm sure in your own emergency department, things are changing pretty much day to day, minute to minute. Things that you think you know at the beginning of the shift are gonna change by the end of the shift. Um, so I'm, we're gonna provide you with the most up-to-date information that we have. Um, as, as we know it of right now, it's 7.30 here on the East Coast, it's 4.30 there on the West Coast. So, um, and everywhere in between, this is what we know kind of at this moment. And we've got some pretty up-to-date stuff to share with you as well. Um, and we've gathered information from, say, the Association of Nursing Professional Development, the um, Emergency Nurses Association, American Association of Critical Care Nurses, and some new stuff just came out with the Surviving Sepsis Campaign and a lot of really good information with the Society of Critical Care Medicine. So those resources, we're going to provide those to you. Um, we have websites, and we'll uh, provide those towards the end of our, um, our town hall today. So I thought I would get us at least started uh, with a few highlights, um, a few things to think about as you create um, and update your plan to train these non-ED nurses to assist in the emergency department. So um, I, we got Olivia on the phone and she is also gonna be taking um, some questions. So please feel free to send her any questions that you might have. And we'd love to use those to kind of start this discussion going and hopefully provide you with um, some good resources. Um, and then Bill is going to share um, some information about um, how do we prep our nursing staff as well as these surge nurses um, with the equipment and the personal protective equipment and things like that that they need um, and what kind of interesting things people are doing out there to uh, supplement the, the, the storage of stuff that we have. So I think this is going to be a great discussion. I hope you enjoy it. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so first of all, I think it's an important uh, thing to remember that um, ED need to be prepared for staff shortages and um, staff are getting sick, right? So we are, um, we're seeing our own staff possibly going out um, and we're looking for kind of all hands on deck when it comes to caring for these surges that we're seeing in the emergency department. So we can pretty much expect that they're going to uh, run out of um, nurses and doctors to take care of all these patients. We're certainly seeing that in some areas of our country, and I think the rest of the country is hoping to stave off that, um, but let's get prepared for it. So if we have some training plans ahead of time, we can ensure that our nurses that are caring for these patients are able to provide the competent, safe care that we always expect out of our emergency departments. So, um, so I think Selecting the right nurses is a really good start. So I, I kind of went to our five rights, right? So I'm going to give you three rights. Um, so it makes sense to select the right nurses. So man, if you've got nurses other places in the hospital that have previous EB experience, this is the time to pull them in, right? So see if there's some staff who have left your, re your department recently who might want to come back and hang out with you and help along uh, during this time. Um, and then obviously looking for other critical care experience, but more importantly, volunteers. Uh, many people are nervous about working in an emergency department in general, um, let alone during a pandemic, which most of us have never seen, right? So um, getting volunteers is a great way to kind of get this started. And, and we can talk more about what that really looks like, um, kind of based off of your questions. And then uh, training the right skills. So what is it we really expect for them to be doing? 
Do we really want them doing being an actual emergency room nurse? Are we going to need them to be? Um, in the initial time frame, maybe it's just assisting and kind of helping hands. But as this pandemic goes on, we can expect to need these additional nurses for anywhere between the next few months and maybe a year out from now, depending on how this evolves. And I just don't know that we know at this point what that's ultimately gonna look like. So it's important for us to try and um, prepare and have kind of phased um, implementation of this. So let's get them up and running right away, but then do we need to maybe push that a little bit farther in terms of teaching them additional skills and, and growing them as ER nurses down the line? Um, but obviously starting with the right foundational ED skills is a great place to start. Um, medication administration, medications they may not be used to giving. I mean, giving them the resources so that they can uh, be able to reference those meds. If you've got references that you provide to your own ED staff, this is a great time to provide them with those same resources. Um, and then you have to think about how do I create the right team? So how, how does this look um, when you're looking at like your graphics sheet or your staffing plan or something like that? Uh, obviously asking them to take a full load of ER patients um, the same way as you do with our trained staff doesn't really make any sense, right? So how do we get them into a team nursing? What are their responsibilities are gonna be? And then what are we expecting our ED nurses to be able to do in terms of functioning and delegating and, and kind of running the show for them and a surge nurse? So kind of thinking in terms of those, those types of things. And then, you know, when you're setting up your training, uh, I, I've had an opportunity to do this and um, creating a really safe environment for them to, you know, many of these are experienced nurses who are suddenly thrust into a novice, uh, you know, kind of, uh, role and they're they're nervous and they don't want to look dumb and so they may not ask questions unless we create that really safe environment where you are encouraging them to ask questions ask questions because many times we don't think about the things that we that we teach we just it's part of our natural language it's part of you know uh, the terminology we use every day and although we think of ourselves as a as a whole as nurses each individual area, each specialty has a little bit of terminology that's specific to them. So getting them comfortable with that and encouraging them to ask more questions regarding that. Um, and then as much hands-on stuff, right? So most of us, we don't do well just sitting there listening to a PowerPoint, you know, and we want to put our hands on things. So if I'm teaching you how, you know, to use a certain piece of equipment, let's practice with it. So making those resources available. And then I think, you know, I, I started on in an inpatient unit when I was uh, first a nurse and uh, the ED way of doing things is just a little bit different, right? So many times the way we draw our blood versus the way that they draw blood on the floor, how we start our IVs, how we do certain things, there is an ED way about us. Uh, and trying to, you know, infuse all that education with, I know that's how you do it on the floor, but this is how we do it in the ER in a kind and respectful and encouraging way. Uh, there's a lot of resources. I mean, we're going to, like I said, we're going to provide you with some of those tonight, but there's a ton of resources out there, both for the ED staff, as well as any surge staff that might be coming into the department. Um, and so providing those via learning modules, whatever learning platform you use, um, Canvas or HealthStream, whatever the, the, the system is, is that your hospital uses. Um, but then also having some videos kind of available uh, that maybe are specific to your hospital, um, your equipment, things like that. And then one of the things I found worked really well for us was after having this didactic time where we had, you know, classroom um, environment, we actually had them out on the floor right away with the ED staff. Um, so we got them really comfortable, we showed them around, we took them on a tour, but then we shoved them right out there with the ED staff to uh, really kind of train them and let them see how all of those things that we had talked about in class made sense. Um, and then the piece, I think I, I you know, I kind of, I thought about all the, the training stuff first and then all of a sudden I thought, wow, I am putting these nurses who, you know, have no ED experience with a bunch of nurses who don't know how to work with nurses who don't aren't ER nurses. And so I actually had to create some education um, from the my own ED staff to uh, talk about what the expectation is and how these surge nurses were supposed to be utilized, um, mostly so that I didn't set them up for failure. Last thing I wanted to do was put two nurses together and neither one knew what the other expected. And uh, that was just setting up our own staff for failure. 
Um, and then scheduling, right? So getting them scheduled, having them down in our department, and then kind of what the expectations of them were from us. Um, they were ours now, and we were really responsible for ensuring that they had everything that they needed from training um, to places to, you know, put their stuff like lockers or at least a secure area where they can keep it um, and letting them have access to pretty much anything our EV staff were going to have access to. We wanted them to have access to that same thing from equipment to, you know, a locker to a place to put their lunch. So that was really an important part of our training. So hopefully that's already starting to spawn some questions that you guys might have. And um, I would love to start that discussion and I'll hand it over to Bill to talk a little bit about um, some, you know, ways for us to, to prepare these nurses. Yeah, well, thank you, Kara. So the other part I wanted to talk about is in that surge, uh, in some of the resources you talked about, uh, we're gonna uh, share more of those uh, towards the end, but um, we, we wanted to give you some of the, the references there. Uh, in the end, we're gonna uh, flesh those out for you um, and uh, Olivia will post uh, the specific links uh, for you, but I wanted to, to talk to you about where we got those. Um, but for my part of it, uh, Carrie talked to you about um, you know, her struggles in uh, training, giving the knowledge to these, these, uh, these nurses that are coming down to our department. Um, but what I wanted to focus on was kind of the question that many of us are talking about is, how do we equip them though? They came down and she's equipping their mind, but we have to equip their body, right? We have to give them PPE and, we, uh, and many other things. But one of the things is, is uh, equipment. Right, so we know that the resources for PPE are dwindling, and every uh, model that we've looked at, they all show that they're insufficient. Um, many of those are showing they're insufficient this week, this month, but certainly they're going to be insufficient um, before this is over. Um, so, one of the things Kara is jumping on uh, to show you that while we, most all of us, and I think many of you are going to agree with us, that our hospitals, at least in Oregon. Um, almost everyone I've talked to is we're all seeing this dip, this quiet, this, don't use the keyword, this lull before the storm, right? Um, this, you know, our senses are down. The, the, those that are braving the EDs are, are generally ill, right? Um, the, the nonsense is generally not coming in right now. Um, so we're, we're getting lower senses, but um, it's gonna get worse, right? It's gonna get, um, you know, these surges. Um, so just like Kara wants to take this time to, to train that staff for the surge, we also have to figure out while we might have enough PPE right now, and, we're, and many of us are struggling even right now, we're certainly not going to have enough PPE for when it gets any worse than this. Um, so going back to the, the, the tried and true, reduce, reuse, recycle um, is what many are, are using, uh, but you got to modify it a little bit. Um, reduce waste. So a lot of, of um, re-examining ways that we can just common sense sort of practice. But, you know, I don't mean uh, reduce waste by, you know, breaking standard practices, right? Like reusing the same gloves on every patient or, you know, reuse your mask the entire shift or every shift or forever. No, you know, when it's not usable or it's not functional or it's not safe, don't keep using it. But things like sanitize it when it's appropriate on the same patient, things like that, you know, follow safety uh, protocols. But when it's acceptable, try to reduce wasting equipment. Those are all good ideas. Um, reuse materials. This is one of the things I want to showcase a little bit. There's some really great innovative ideas that are coming out. Um, uh, there's two specifically using, um, you know, reusing materials that have normally been wasted. And on the next slide, I'll show you a little more about it but um, using surgical drapes or other materials to make masks out of them. Um, they're very similar materials, but uh, people are uh, redesigning them and redeploying them as either surgical or potentially respirator-like masks. Um, so very innovative, very cool ways to do it. And then recycle, recycling outdated ideas. Um, now Jeff talks, did a great job this last week um, talking both in his ventilator um, lecture, if you saw that last Monday, or on Thursday when he did his ARDS uh, lecture. He talked a lot about um, the new guidelines. Many of them aren't new, they're just you know, stating them again for you. Um, but talking about the true uses for when we need respiration, when we can, uh, when uh, standard droplet precautions are, are required. Um, so reminding our staff of you know, when appropriate uh, PPE is, is required and using those guidelines to make sure that we're 
um, using the equipment appropriately um, and not um, you know, over utilizing, if you will, and using the wrong equipment when it's not required, uh, just to make sure that we can uh, make it go as far as possible. Um, the, and then the examples that I wanted to show about some of that innovation for that reusing equipment that or, or um, things that might otherwise be uh, tossed out. Now, this is one example. Um, you'll see uh, on the left there of the screen, uh, surgical maceration. Now, this is not unique to Oregon. Um, this is, I've, I've seen uh, stories on this all over the country, but uh, from my hospital here in Oregon, um, they're doing uh, mass creation kits. Now these are surgical masks, so this would be droplet precautions, um, but they're taking uh, the uh, standard drapes um, and then repurposing those um, and creating kits, and then they send them out to the community. Now, what I put on the, the screen there is the actual instruction sheet that they have with those kits. Um, now, the link that I put there, and, and Liv, you're welcome to, to put that out into the comments if anybody's interested in it. Now, this one is just so you can see more information about it. Um, full disclosure, um, they ran out of, of material for now, so it's actually closed at my hospital, but if you're looking for information or if you want the pattern um, they're sharing that pattern for any hospital who wants it. So if they wanted to share it uh, and they got it from someone else, so it's not like they made it up, um, but it's a way that they could make surgical masks. Um, and they ended up making, I believe the number was 10,000 in four days. They made 10,000 surgical masks that they were able to use. Um, but then the other one is from University of Florida, which many of you probably saw this. Uh, it's an article that uh, anesthesiology professor um, found the the sterile uh, packaging that they, the, the wrap that they put around uh, sterile um, instruments before they uh, sterilize them. Um, I didn't know this, it's called Halyard H600. Uh, apparently that's what it's called. Uh, but it's that wrap that they put around and they generally dispose of it. But uh, he found that it is, uh, now they did calculations on this. This is not approved uh, you know, federally, but uh, efficacy is, is uh, very near, if not slightly uh, better, they estimate, than an N95 for blocking um, things. Let's just say like um, viruses. Um, I don't want to say that it is, um, could be used in place of an N95, but they're making these masks that might be um, uh, usable uh, if we didn't have N95s. Um, but again, just the way to be innovative. Um, so they're, you know, they can make 10 masks out of these, which we would have just been throwing away anyway. So just the idea of way they're um, trying to think outside of the box. Now take this on top of all the other things we're doing to try to um, overcome these deficits. So again, just tossing these out as, as some of the hundreds and hundreds of stories that are happening all the time. Now, I wanna add to this though, um, you know, the, our federal guidelines, the CDC is still saying that this sort of uh, do-it-yourself homemade masks are still only recommended when you have no other option. But I'm going to tell you, if you don't have another option, you need to do what you have to do to protect yourself, right? Uh, which brings me to the last little thing I wanted to bring up. Um, about an hour ago, um, we got this information sent to us. Um, Ontario Nurses Association in Canada uh, released this today. Um, and again, Livia, if you could uh, post this out into the uh, comments for everybody, um, but it was a, a message sent uh, by the Ontario Nurses Association um, recommending, and in summary, um, urging, recommending, Jeff, if you wanna, if you're there, if you wanna speak to this, you might be able to speak uh, to it as well. Um, but um, I believe it urges um, uh, hospitals or, or nurses to be able to choose what PPE um, they have and that their employers or the hospitals not to be able to stop them from, from obtaining or, or protecting themselves in these situations. Now, please read the article. I had about 15 minutes to read it, so I might be misquoting it slightly, um, but please, I wanna offer that to you to read it. But the idea is, you know, you know large organizations stepping in to protect the nurses, um, you know, trying to get them to to be able to protect themselves and whatever means necessary. From what I took away from this, this would allow them to, if you don't have anything, you can, you can use what you need to use to protect yourself. So the point that Karen and I wanted to do is, we're not trying to give you the answers. We're trying to generate questions for you so we can have a good discussion here. So the, beyond this, uh, we just had listed out, Karen, if you wanna speak to these, 
your references you have here? Yeah, so uh, the first one that's there is the Association of Nursing Professional Development. So ANPD um, just recorded um, a recorded webinar a couple of days ago um, that talked about optimizing nursing staff during a pandemic. Um, and it was uh, three of our peers uh, who were talking about what they did at their facility um, in Indiana, and it is excellent. Um, I've had an opportunity to, uh, to watch it myself, and they gave some really good um, evidence-based you know, ideas on how to create a staffing plan, um, how to create a, um, a uh, you know, a training uh, plan for staff who are gonna be surging down in the emergency department. Um, and then they also have this uh, webinar on preparing educational, for educational emergencies, which is not specific necessarily to pandemic, but for those of us who are working in education right now, I'm sure you got about as much time as I did in terms of, I need you to create this, I need you to train this, and a lot of it is just in time training. How to don and off, how to you know put together a training plan, build this curriculum, those kinds of things, and and so this kind of speaks to that, which is is nice because you know rarely do we talk about educational emergencies, but um, I think in this case we are we are being pushed to do a lot of our work up front so that when everything you know becomes um, chaotic at your facility, that um, everything's already done, and so trying to push that forward. So. Those are two really good um, blogs, or, I'm sorry, webinars to, to check out. Um, and then the next one is um, uh, AACN, and they've got a massive amount of education on their website. It has been a jewel for our staff to be able to use um, in terms of kind of seeing uh, what stuff is out there for ventilator training and uh, what's up there for coronavirus updates and um, how to manage these people. And in addition to training, obviously the ED staff were looking to train inpatient nurses. This is a really good opportunity to kind of elevate everyone's education. So I certainly have used a lot of these resources and, and, and posted it out to my staff um, to um, make it a little bit easier. And as you can see, there's specific things in the pulmonary like ARDS, how to manage ventilators, what does they mean by proning patients, which is not something we do in the emergency department setting. Um, and then if you're a facility who, uh, you know, has to do ECMO, that is definitely something we're seeing um, in our patient population, at least um, here um, in Virginia. And then obviously some stuff on infection prevention and then um, professional development, you know, again, jump, jumping up front and really trying to prepare nurses. So really good stuff there on the ACN website. And then obviously our very own ENA, uh, is going to come to the rescue when it comes to certain things. And really important on there was the disaster standards of care. And I think it, when I read through this, it kind of gave me a good platform, a good foundation for where I should be expecting nurses to continue to practice. Because when we talk about disaster mode, uh, a lot of times our regular standards kind of get pushed to the wayside and we're just trying to save lives. But this kind of helped set that foundation. So I really I personally appreciated reading through that and, and reminding myself that although there's a lot of patients coming in, we still have certain standards we need to be meeting. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they've got the surviving sepsis campaign uh, stuff on there as well. And then if you haven't already been on the Society of Critical Care Medicine, I think Bill, you already talked about that. I know that Jeff talked about it on his webinar um, last week, but uh, they've got a great um, ventilator training how to, for non-ED, I'm sorry, non-ICU nurses. And so, as I'm thinking about how to train the emergency department and the inpatient nurses coming down, it makes sense to train both of them kind of with the same, you know, information and classroom work, so. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, one question has come in just a second ago. Uh, can you wear the same mask all day if you are not caring for a COVID patient? I, I can take that one if you want, or you can take yeah, it. Yeah, if you want, that's fine. Well, so, um, Based on the standards for for CDC, um, they the 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 standards there are going to be a little bit loose. They're going to say um, as long as it's not soiled, um, you're going to follow your your guidelines. Um, I'm going to say go back to your facilities standards though, because every state and every facility is going to have slightly different, but they're going to vary on your your CDC and CMS uh, guidelines there. Carrie, do you want to speak to what you guys do in that case? Yeah. 
So we are issuing out um, a mask to all of our staff, but we are telling them that as soon as it gets soiled, that it needs to be changed out. Um, we certainly don't want people feeling as if they're not protected. When it comes to the surgical masks, I think we're utilizing them for a little bit longer period of time than we are with our N95s, whereas we're using those obviously in our airborne rooms and those have a tendency to get changed out a little bit more. Uh, but with the surgical masks, yeah, as long as they seem to be still in good repair, people are continuing to wear them. And you know how people wear them. They wear them down below their chin half the time um, when they want to take them off and on. Remember, those surgical masks are really designed to help keep droplets from the patient to the air so that we are not breathing them in or being exposed by them. Um, so it's really important more to put the mask on the patient because that's what's going to help keep those droplets in, but um, one of the best benefits of wearing a mask for a healthcare provider or even an administrative or whomever is um, is that I keep reminding you to not touch your face, which is what a whole lot of this has been about, um, is, is, is keeping your hands as I'm like watching myself touch my face. I know you can't help it. Yeah. Um, you, have you counted how many times you've touched your face in the last week? So yeah, it's, it's a hard thing to do, but that having that mask on reminds you not to be touching your face and, and to keep your hands away from those mucous membranes. Yeah. Awesome. So we kind of touched on this, but who are the best nurses to start originally pulling from? This is definitely yours, Kara. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the best areas to kind of look at is who do you already have floating? Uh, at least in my facility, we've got nurses who are in hospital float nurses, or maybe, you know, I'm part of a system. So, um, you know, a system float nurses who might be assigned to your area. Uh, they're already used to kind of jumping into different um, arenas. So, and and at least for us, I'll tell you, there's been, you know, we have a lot of, we have borders sometimes. And so those nurses are down in our emergency department already. So it makes sense to reach out to people who are already comfortable with your department, people who might've been down there helping in other ways. Uh, grabbing onto them first is a great way to get started. Uh, like I said earlier, anytime you've got nurses who, um, you know, have our ex-ED nurses, they have stepped away from the profession for just a little bit because, you know, they, being an ER nurse is hard and sometimes you just got to step away. And um, many of them have volunteered to come back, at least in my facility. Um, so that would be, you know, putting out the call and asking for people willing to come back and work. Um, and then you want to look, I would say, start looking at the areas of your hospital that are going to start to um, decrease their staffing. So places like um, PACUs and, and um, outpatient ORs and things like that that might be um, have these nurses who are used to dealing with patients coming out of anesthesia and might need some you know kind of respiratory support and then they're bringing their expertise to the ER uh, to kind of um, you know be able to, to supplement what an ER nurse knows and then they work really well as a team so that's a great place to start and like I mentioned volunteers and if you can get volunteers, they're going to be a much happier group of people yeah. than if you um, are voluntold telling them to show up. So yeah, and that's and that's what I've been uh, talking to the the two hospitals I've worked at most recently. Um, they with all the elective surgeries down, uh, the nurses that had most recently migrated away into PACU and and surgery and things like that, um, they're coming back. So that was that was an easy answer. Yeah. Cool. Angie would like to know, do you have any good resources for preparing ED nurses to assist with intubation when respiratory therapists are unavailable? Or do you have any recommendations on how to train for this based on experience? Yeah, so what we um, have kind of looked at is, is those resources that we threw up there earlier. Um, Olivia, I think you were planning on putting them in the comments section or making them available. Those are really good resources to kind of reach out to immediately. They will, um, they do, they're little, little chunks and they take it a little bit at a time, how to manage the vented patient, how to deal with the alarms, how to troubleshoot, those kinds of things. But to be honest, I reached out to um, our lead respiratory therapist and I just asked him, I said, hey, I, I need like a one pager. I need to know what the most important things are gonna be if you're standing in the middle of the ER and there are five ventilators that are, you know, alarming all at once, and you're having to stand in the middle and yell at us to do what, you know, um, what does that alarm say? Do this. And a, a lot of it's going to be kind of your basics, um, how to put it on FiO2 of 100, how to suction, you know, don't suction when you're going down, suction when you're coming back up. And 
And if you can find that one person who, who knows those little specifics about your facility, about the kinds of things that they would need you to do, because we talk about the ED nurses delegating to these surge nurses, but let's be honest, we have way more, less respiratory therapists in our hospitals than we do nurses. And so when, when push comes to shove and you've got multiple ventilators going on in your ED, they're going to be delegating to you. So kind of reaching out to them ahead of time is a great way to do that. Um, I know that's what I've done, uh, but those resources and just getting our staff comfortable with the basic fun functions, not you know how to adjust ventilator settings based off of ABGs, that's more than I can handle in a pandemic. I just need to know the basic <laughs> functions. Hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> So Kelly says that her hospital system wants her to start training OR nurses to work in the ED since they are off right now. Any tips for training them to the ED department specifically? They're yeah, that, that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. And that's kind of what I was asked to do too is, and I didn't know who I was gonna be training. Um, and OR nurses are, um, are, are bringing an incredible expertise that, you know, it's just kind of flipping the way that they think. Um, usually when a patient is seen anywhere else in the hospital, they have a diagnosis. Um, our job is to take all those symptoms and, and figure out what the diagnosis is. Uh, so I think honestly is one, figure out what you want them to do. Um, what are their expertise? Are these, when we say OR nurses, sometimes we loop, uh, you know, kind of pull in PACU and pre-op and places like that as well when we talk about OR nurses. Um, and pre-op nurses, they're excellent at starting IVs. They are great at getting your blood draws. So really finding out where their expertise is. And then we focused on, again, really looking at what jobs do we need them to do and how do we do them differently than everywhere else in the hospital? So whether it was the way that we started our IVs, whether um, our falls precautions, like we don't have fall mats, we, you know, our structures don't have fall alarms. What do we use? Um, Think more things like that, um, so that we can, yeah, um, so that we can hopefully, you know, get them so that they're comfortable with our way of doing things. Because to be honest, anyone can stock, anyone can provide patients with um, blankets, anyone can get um, a patient up to the bathroom. It's going to be those little things that are going to become so important. We need them to be nurses and to, um, you know, and to fixate on that art of nursing and really make them com uh, uh, the patients comfortable. So playing on their, their, their strengths is a great way to start. Yeah, great answer. This one kind of pings off of that one. And Katie, I'll come back to your question. I know you're next in line, but what kind of assignments or tasks do you recommend for the surgeon nurses if they can't really take a patient assignment? Hmm. So well, you here. know, what we've done is we've, We've paired our nurses um, together with, uh, with an ED nurse um, with the expectation that then the patient load grows slightly. Um, so we, things like IVs, all the stuff that as a nurse, you know how to do, right? So um, IV starts, uh, blood draws, uh, medication administration, being able to sign off meds if they're critical care nurses or they have that background and they feel comfortable getting patients up to the bathroom, talking with them, doing education, you know, explaining the process. Um, that's a lot of the things that we focused on. Uh, but we also focused on making sure that the, um, like the fall bundle, and if a patient required anything special in terms of medications that we covered that with them. And again, providing them with the same resources that we provided all of our nurses with. Uh, those are the kinds of things that we, we focused on. Uh, but the bigger question is, is what, what do you need them to do? What makes your nurses more productive because they don't have to do it? For us, it was about not having to get every patient up to the bathroom or being able to provide them with comfort measures that when I'm an ED nurse, I'm triaging, I'm assessing, I'm, I'm doing those kinds of things. We wanted to take that off their plate and let them just focus on the tasky stuff. All right, is it safe for oncology nurses to float? Does that put the oncology patients at risk? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a tough one because again, we don't want any cross contamination. Um, I mean, obviously, I think every hospital is pulling from the you know the specialties that they can, and you know if if that is a is a population of nurses that they have as a resource, it's hard to say no to that. Um, I think there needs to be clearly a discussion about not having you know if those nurses are going to come down and work in the ER, maybe it's a small group of them. 
um, and then that way they're not going back and forth between the units. And I would say the same thing with all of our, you know, immunocompromised patient populations, whether that's our NICU babies or our, you know, other uh, pediatric oncology, um, other areas like that where they may need to go back and care for those patients. Um, yeah, that's a really tough one, but, you know, every hospital is going to need to reach out to whatever resources they have. And then something like this, you, you kind of use what you can. And another, to add on to that, um, um, another plan that one of the hospitals in my area is doing is there, um, in the la recent years, we've, we've gone away from the segregated uh, bedding of patients. And so instead of having, you know, one uh, pod in our ED as the critical pod, and this one is the, you know, OB area, which we used to always do. Um, now we segregate or we, we integrate patients and they're just, just everyone is everywhere. Um, that hospital decided to go back to segregation so that respiratory only goes in one section and immunocompromise goes in one section again. Um, so one option, now this is just me talking for me, right? Might be when you have that, that nurse who floats down from maybe a, a sensitive area, potentially, you know, um, oncology or something, potentially they would go with your patient who's going to segregate in a, in the same, you know, like your immunocompromised, where you're going to be trying to put patients who would also be protected. You know, that might be something to consider, but it's a great question. It's a great, I don't know that we have a perfect answer, but right now when we have the, the luxury of, uh, you know, time to think about it, that's, it's definitely a, a great, um, point to consider now. Uh, at some point that we're going to get to to a place where we're not going to be able to to segregate those anymore. We're just going to, you're going to come to, uh, and Carrie, you and I had this discussion earlier today. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, who is part of your crisis? Who's part of your your COVID crisis? Well, everyone, you know, you're, you're, there's no such thing as a non, at some point, there's going to be no such thing as a non-COVID patient. Everyone who comes to the ED is going to be part of the disaster. I'm sorry you had a broken leg today. You're now a COVID broken leg because you came to the crisis, right? We're not there yet. And, you know, that's not going to be where we're at, but, you know, we're going to try to keep planning so we can keep as much distance before we get there as possible. Okay, good follow-up question. How do you manage the non-COVID-19 patients during this surge? You want to take that? I, I, yeah, I know we're trying to segregate still. Um, we are, we're trying to kind of run one triage and a second triage and trying to keep those separate. Um, and that's because in our area, we have we do have community spread, but it's not in in the levels of uh, some of the other states that, you know, obviously we've been watching on the news. So we're still trying to keep them separate. Um, I don't know that how much longer we're gonna be able to do that, uh, but yeah, treating them with the same um, protections though. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the things I've been seeing um, in, in articles and stuff like that, that, that uh, doctors and nurses who are actually caring for large numbers of these patients, some of the things that we're seeing is that you can be asymptomatic and have, you know, a random chest x-ray for something completely different and a spine COVID on it. So I think we need to have some consideration that regardless of what your complaint is, we have to assume that you've been potentially exposed to the grocery store, Lord knows at the park, all of those places still, um, and so we as healthcare providers need to protect ourselves. We need to treat everyone as if they are potentially positive um, with the protection pieces, but at the same time, you know, offering them the level of care that an ER, your ER is always going to be able to provide them to the best of their ability. And I'm afraid it's going to be a trap if we, if we use that distance triage to segregate from raw symptom and say, oh, well, because you don't have a cough or you don't have a fever, right. that you must be safe and I'm going to then have less precautions. You know, as you said, I mean, there's a, a huge population there percentage wise that is, is, you know, silent carriers and, you know, are we just gonna bypass our own protections there? So not to be alarmist, but, you know, back to your question, how do you treat the non COVID? I think you do it with the same precautions you did everyone else. Um, any tips for making it a smooth transition for the non-ED nurses that are surging to the ED? Communication and compassion. Yeah, just being nice. I think they're afraid of us. They they really feel as if we are, um, we do have a little bit of a weird sense of humor. I think we, you know, have a, a personality trait. Um, 
more than anything, tell them thank you. Thank you for joining us in this fight. Thank you for coming to the front lines. We know it's scary. We're scared too, um, but we're you know we're we're going to make it through this together. Um, obviously, food always makes things a little bit smoother. I don't know about you, but my hospital is inundated. I'm going to have to go on a huge diet when we're done with this. Um, but I you know I think more than anything is if possible. Allow them as much time in your department ahead of time as you can. Um, and if that means, you know, partial shifts or, you know, coming down one out of their three shifts, something like that, so that they can just hang out in the ER, get used to the flow, get used to where stuff is. I mean, it's important. I need to know where urinals are and I need to know where vomit bags are. If I don't know where those two things are, then it's a really bad day. So if you can give them the time to just get used to things, I think that helps and makes it a little bit smoother. And I know that's not an option for every single hospital, depending on your size. You may need those nurses in their units until you, you have no other choice, but whenever possible, allow them just a little bit of time to come down and hang out and get to know the staff, get to know the doctors, get to, you know, and right now, I don't know about you, but we're all wearing scrubs that are not our normal colors. We've got masks on, we've got hair caps on, and half the time, you don't actually know who anyone is because you don't recognize their eyes. Like <laughs> I'm used to seeing a whole face. And so it, it's just an adjustment time for them. Plus they get comfortable with us. They're going to start to ask the questions. That would probably be my best advice for a smooth transition is to give them as much time in your department as you can. Awesome. So Shannon says that California is gearing up to bring nursing students nearing graduation on board. Don't know if they will land in the ER, but if they do, and considering that they won't have the skills or confidence of experienced nurses from other specialties, what are your suggestions for how to best utilize them? Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> that's my home state, so I, I feel you. Um, it, you know, I think if anything, there are a lot of things that need to happen in an emergency room that do not require nursing skills. Um, they have foundation for sure, um, but you know, when it comes to just tasks that need to be done. So I need this stocked. I need my blankets in the warmer. I need this patient to have what they need. And to be honest with you, most patients, the reason for their anxiety in our ER is because we don't have time to just talk to them, tell them the plan, communicate with them, listen to their stories. I can't tell you how many times I've actually been like backing out of a room being like, okay, okay, you know, as, as they're trying to tell their story. and. For many of these patients, it might almost make them feel better to just be heard. Mm -hmm. And that's a great utilization of a nursing student because that's what they got to do in nursing school, right? They always got the opportunity to sit and talk with patients. Um, providing just the basic necessities is something that they've, they've been doing in clinical. Um, you know, again, bathroom, water, food, that kind of thing. And um, finding a way for them to feel um, useful in those initial stages. But I think we have to consider that this is, might go on for a while. Um, and we may need to start actually training them to be nurses. So if these are nurses who may end up in your emergency department, uh, invest in them, invest in their education and their transition. Um, it's not under the best circumstances. I think we can all agree on that. None of us would have wanted to come out of nursing school and been shoved into a pandemic, but um, what a great story down the line. But uh, use them for what they can and then start investing in their, their ongoing education. Great. Well, would you add anything to that? No, that's, I mean, th th that's what we do. And was the question for nursing students or new grads? Uh, so there looks like they're nursing students that are nearing graduation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, I wouldn't add anything else to that, but yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of them are having trouble like getting in to sit for their boards and things like that. And there's some states that are talking about granting them, you know, if you graduate right. from your nurse accredited nursing school, just granting you like a provisional nursing license. Um, going back to graduate, I know a lot life. of states are looking at that. Yeah. So what are, what do we do about the minimum certification requirements such as ACLS for transporting monitored patients and other tasks during this crisis? Yeah. So Bill and I were actually talking a little bit about this as well. You know, what, especially since those kinds of classes are the ones that seem to be, um, getting postponed and especially no, renewals. Um, American Heart put out a, uh, you know, a deferment of like 60 or 90 days now. So um, you don't have to renew right away. Um, the problem is, is new certification. So, you know, I think in the initial stages, as much as we can, 
you know, try and have um, nurses who do have those qualifications. Again, we're trying to meet those those ENA standards of care, right? So we want to make sure that our, our patients are still getting the, the quality of care, the certi certified care that we provide to them. Um, and then obviously every hospital is gonna handle this differently um, in terms of where they get to that huge surge and they just have to start tapping into the resources that they have. Um, you know, suggestions might be that instead of the ED nurse who doesn't have ACLS, maybe the nurse from upstairs who does have ACLS comes down and picks up their patient. Um, that might be a, a, a the next step. And then how do we hold ACLS classes in small enough groups that we can get a few people trained, a few people trained when it's a two day class, that's really hard. Um, but I think at some point American Heart Association is gonna, if it, you know, they've already started to create a lot of an online platform, how much of it transitions to a full online platform um, with just maybe an hour's worth of hands-on demonstrations, similar to the way the refreshers are set up. Uh, I think there's some value in that. Um, but I think initially in this initial surge phase, we have to try and maintain that certain requirement, right? And I'm sure most hospitals would agree with that. Um, but I think yep. every hospital is gonna do something different. So. And the other side we have to be careful of is, is remember that while this is a crisis, right? Um, Kara hit the nail on the head. We can't relax our standards, right? We still have to provide a level of quality to our patients. Right. And so there has been a relaxation um, on like, let's say, um, like for PPE, there was a relaxation on expiration dates uh, for masks. So we can use them beyond their expiration. There's been and there's been relaxation on uh, licensure for I know California. Um, somebody speak to it if I'm mis uh, quoting this, if you're from California, uh, but like uh, providers, I believe physicians, physician assistants, uh, NPs, maybe RNs. Um, their licensure from other states was counting, I think, temporarily, but things like that. So there's there's certain relaxations, but there's certain quality measures and certain safety standards. We want to make sure we're not going to relax. Now, at some point, we're going to get to a disaster level threat here, and those things might slip. But what Kara was kind of getting at is that we want to try to meet all of those, if at all possible. But the other side, too, is while we're training that, if Kara and I are both um, you know, doing this team nursing that Kara was kind of presenting, and I'm the the you know floor nurse, let's say, um, and I don't have the the ED certifications here, um, and she does. Well, if I'm working with her f for three weeks, fine, she can do all the things that that the ED nurse needed to do. But if I'm working for for three months, it is she is not going to want to do all those things forever. At some point, we're going to have to figure out how we make me an equal team member here. So that's the only other thing to do without just relaxing it and saying, well. <laughs> he'll be fine. And I think that's where the investment in these nurses who are coming down to do us such the favor becomes valuable. Um, if we invest in them early enough, then we've got a, a more qualified teammate than if we don't. And that's why this planning is so important. Thinking forward to think about what, what can we do because eventually, uh, ultimately we want to get the best care for these patients. How so something that we talked about in our ARDS lecture, um, was the prone position and Sarah would like to know the prone position can be best for the patients that progress to ARDS. How do you manage that if you only have regular hospital beds and how would she educate her staff if she's never really done this? Normally they ship, they ship critical patients to a larger center. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm actually looking into a lot of that myself. Um, hopefully Jeff, who is my ARDS expert on, on the line here, can answer that even better than I can. But, um, you know, I think we're, we are the masters of getting creative on how we manage things. And, in, in, and if it were me trying to figure out how to do this, I'd be reaching out to my ICU partners and begging for help. How can I make what you guys do in the ICU something that I can do down in the ER? Um, you know, I've been reading stories of people who, once the patients are intubated up on the floor because they need to transition to an, a critical care area, they're coming back down to the emergency room to, to board while they wait for ICU beds. I mean, that's not something we would ever normally allow, but when you don't have another option, that's exactly what needs to happen. And then I'm required to manage these patients at an ICU level. Um, and I think I would be begging for help. And, and that's when we start reaching out to our partners and saying, you know, what are my options here? Can I, how do I get the beds that you guys are using? Um, Cause you're right, that's not something that we do. We just don't. And um, 
yeah, I think that's probably our best resource. Jeff might be there. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I, I assume you can hear me. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you, yeah, there is no easy answer to your question. I would just remind you that when we started prone positioning, what, a decade ago or whatever it was, we didn't have special beds. Um, we prone positioned in whatever position the, uh, um, the, the, the what, what, and so whatever bed the patient was in. Now, is that ideal? Absolutely not. Is it easy? Absolutely not. But I think, Kara, you said it. This is a, this is a time of creativity invention. And this is when we tap into our critical care nurses who do it all the time that will probably have some suggestions for us how to pad patients appropriately when their stomach on a regular bed. But is it possible? Absolutely. Um, we did it for many years until they developed the special beds for us. So, Thank you. I, I, um, I think there's one or two questions left at the bottom. And what I'm going to ask is that uh, Bill or Kara will be able to answer those in writing afterwards. We've really gone over time quite a bit here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was looking at the time. Yeah, so we will answer any further questions that come up down below. The other thing I would remind you all is if you do have further questions, or not further questions, further suggestions on topics that you would find helpful like this, um, we will gladly do our best to try to put it together. So put your suggestions uh, in the comments below or send us an email. We'd love to. And I don't know, Bill, do you or uh, do you want me to kind of cover what else we're doing this week? Yeah, go ahead. So just for everybody who's online, just a few things that we are doing Um uh, this week, uh, I guess I could put my camera on so you can see hey. the black screen. <laughs> <There he is. laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, so uh, a few things that we're doing. Uh, just remember that we have our ABG module um, paid. Uh, that's free right now, so you can um, watch it uh, for free. We also did our last week. We did our ventilator management and our ARDS modules, and those are available on Facebook and YouTube for free. So we hopefully you'll find those useful. And then the session that you just watched, that's going to this is going to be archived on Facebook as well and on uh, YouTube. So you'll be able to watch this again, or encourage others to watch it who might have missed it. Wednesday, we're going to be doing a um, session on. Um, ventilators and sedation, how to sedate patients on a ventilator. Um, and this is one topic you guys all asked for. So um, mm -hmm. Wednesday, 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific, we'll be doing that session with Kristen Klein. And then Friday at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 uh, Pacific, um, Andrea Perry is going to be doing a session on tenting in a nurse. <laughs> no, sorry, nursing in a tent, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that went really bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's already been uh, working out in a tent. They've set it up. She says she's learned lots of lessons and they call it their COVID corner. So if you want to watch um, uh, or learn a little bit from um, Andrea about what she's learned working in a tent and how to set one up, join us on Friday. And then remember all this week, we're offering our uh, courses, our TCRN courses, CEN, um, analysis, paralysis, and CPIN courses. We're offering two hours of those if you need CEs and you can get information for signing up for those um, on our Facebook page or else email us and let us know. Hopefully the stuff we're doing, you're finding helpful. Um, we're trying to do our part um, to support you on the front lines. And we just all wanna thank you for everything you're doing. Hang in there, be safe, take care of yourself and enjoy your time with your families. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Kara, and thank you, Olivia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.